This film is a masterpiece in terms of concept, execution, and especially the message behind it, and the core theme running through it. It's a true labour of love. Interstellar is a 2014 film directed by Christopher Nolan, one of my favourite directors of all time. And yes, one day I probably will talk about Batman, but not yet. Much like Nolan's other works, Interstellar was written in collaboration with his brother Jonathan, the man in the box, if you've watched my prestige video. <clears throat> For me, one of the most interesting parts of filmmaking is reading about or watching behind the scenes stuff, seeing what goes into a film, what the process was, how the tapestry is put together. And for a film like Interstellar, this is where we need to start. So the long and short of it is Interstellar is what you get when Carl Sagan sets a film producer and a theoretical physicist up on a blind date. That's not a metaphor, that's literally what happened. Let me explain by talking about contact. Yep, didn't think we'd be going here, did you? Jodie Foster, Jake Busey, etc. But it was here that Interstellar was birthed, when producer Linda Obst and theoretical physicist Kip Thorne who first met when they were set up on a blind date by Carl Sagan, came up with the idea of making another film about the universe whilst collaborating on Contact. Now, you're starting to make the connections. Matthew McConaughey starred in Contact, so he was the link between the two and it moved from there. Nope. Obston Thorne worked on a treatment for the film whilst working on Contact, which attracted the attention of director... That's right, Steven Spielberg. Keep up. With Jonathan Nolan being hired soon afterwards to write the screenplay, the film looks set to go ahead with Spielberg attached as director. However, after Spielberg moved his DreamWorks to Disney from Paramount, Paramount suddenly found themselves in need of a new director. Enter Christopher Nolan, fresh off the back of The Dark Knight, which is just... Oh. Legendary Pictures apparently then made a deal in which, in a move they must still be popping champagne over to this very day, they forewent financing Batman v Superman in return for a stake in Interstellar. The script itself is also fascinating. In the first hour is set on Earth and was written by Jonathan. After watching The Dust Bowl, directed by Ken Loach, Christopher phoned up Loach, who agreed to let him use interviews on the documentary in the film. The reason these interviews feel so genuine and raw is because they are. There was some criticism from people who were a little dismayed that it took so long for the space stuff to begin, but I think spending this time on Earth, in the dust, is essential here. We see what Earth has become, how few people there are, and what people have to do to survive while trying to have some semblance of a normal life. The dust itself is so creepy, it's their old world, their dead pets, friends, relatives blowing in the wind, covering their beds and dinner tables. A constant visual reminder that we have messed the world up beyond repair. The casting is also spot on. Jessica Chastain is brilliant as Murph, Anne Hathaway brings everything you could want to the role of Dr Brand, and finally, we have Matthew McConaughey. Now, I'm not going to go as far as to say that no one but McConaughey could have played this role or that the film wouldn't work without him. However, I am going to say that this is a case of perfect casting. When casting for the role of Coop, Christopher Nolan said he wanted him to be an everyman, and that drew him to McConaughey after watching him in Mud. And let me just say right now, McConaughey is phenomenal as Coop. He is breathtaking. Let's talk about space. One of the reasons I love this film so much is because of its love of space and science. We've had epic sci-fi before and some truly beautiful shots and scenes from other films before, and as I mentioned in my Guardians video, I am a grade A simp for space. But this is the only film that truly explores space. To me, the universe is the most beautiful thing I've ever discovered has existed. As a kid, I was fascinated with space. Each night I would lie in bed and stare at a poster of the solar system I had on my ceiling. Space is beautiful, it's terrifying, it's life and death and chaos and order and something so impossible we cannot wrap our tiny little minds around it no matter how hard we try, while also being the driving force for our continuing quest for knowledge. That is what this film represents for me and what I think the Nolans are trying so hard to show us. The majesty and ferocity of the wonders of our universe. As a teacher, my students knew that a way to pause the lesson for 30 minutes was to ask me about black holes and watch me go on a tangent complete with illustrations on the whiteboard as I explained my own basic understanding of theoretical physics. When I first saw Gargantuan on the screen, I paused and just looked at it for like 10 minutes, trying to comprehend it, trying to work out what each part of it was, and trying to remember everything I'd learned about black holes myself. 
In fact, while I'm here, a little science lesson. You might be wondering why a black hole looks like this. Why does this cloud suddenly shoot up and bend over the top of the black hole? Well, the cloud is called the accretion disk and technically it's not bending over the top of the black hole. It's actually circling it, just like the rings of Jupiter. But the gravity of a black hole bends like in such a way that when we're looking at it from the side, what we're seeing on the top and the bottom is actually the accretion disk on the opposite side of the black hole. Yes, we're seeing behind a black hole because it's bending the light over itself, essentially. To obtain that image of a black hole, Thorne and others worked with a visual effects company Double Negative to produce a new CGI rendering software, which would take theoretical equations and simulate gravitational lensing, essentially the bending of light from the black hole. Some individual frames, individual frames, took up to 100 hours to render. You don't do that if you don't care a shit ton about being faithful to the science. The same goes for the first planet they land on with the mountain high waves, visually stunning. The shot of Earth as they're flying away, this shot of them floating through space to really push home just how empty and unending it all is. The shot of the wormhole, our first glimpse of Gargantua, the sudden and violent death of Dr. Man followed by the all encompassing silence of a vacuum that doesn't care about your death. The way that this movie was filmed and edited and the artistry involved shows a deep, deep love of filmmaking and of science itself. And that love of science especially is abundant throughout the film. The explanations of scientific principles such as time dilution, the lack of sound whenever we get a shot in which the camera would be positioned in a vacuum, the very reason that Murph has her name. Murphy's Law. Well, Murphy's Law doesn't mean that something bad will happen. What it means is that whatever can happen will happen, and that sounded just fine with us. Even the depiction of a wormhole was scientifically accurate with it looking like a sphere with a distorted view of the target galaxy. In fact, we don't really get into science fiction until Coop falls into the black hole. Up until that point, it's all real-life theoretical physics. What this movie did extremely well is express that love for science and progress and exploration. The scene in which Murph is suspended from school because they live in a world where anti-science propaganda is used to make people focus on terrestrial issues is a prime example. Explaining how the Apollo missions were fake to bankrupt the Soviet Union. You don't believe we went to the moon? Our protagonist pushes back and champions science and the truth. They mention that there are no more armies and the quote from Professor Brand, which, when heard in context of this film, really hits home. Every rivet that they strike could have been a bullet. We've done well in the world here. And makes the point that we spent so much time fighting and so little time exploring and progressing. It just so happened that I watched this again in preparation for this video on the same day that I rewatched an episode of Doctor Who one of my all-time favourite shows, surprise, surprise. The episode was Kill the Moon, and it's shocking how well the two line up. The message that space and nature in general can be terrifying, but as Dr. Brand says, it's never evil. Well, you don't think nature can be evil? No. Formidable, frightening, but... No, not evil. And we, as humans, can make a choice to give in to our instincts, to fight and kill, or we can choose to look up, to explore, to venture out, because our future is amongst the stars. In the mid 21st century, humankind starts creeping off into the stars. It does all that because one day in the year 2049, when it had stopped thinking about going to the stars, it looked out there into the blackness and it saw something beautiful, something wonderful that for once it didn't want to destroy. I mean, NASA in this story is literally an underground organisation because they refused to be used as a weapon and instead dedicated themselves to solving their problems with science. That's awesome. By the way, I want to say how awesome TARS is in this film, an ex-marine robot that has been repurposed by NASA, perfectly symbolising the shift in this world and the patchwork nature of this little group venturing out into the stars. I've used the word love a few times throughout this video because that's what I feel when watching it. And that's what this film is. Its central theme is love. And why wouldn't you make a film about space a film about love? They're the two biggest things we know. And that's not just a corny line, it's true. Because love is the driving force behind humanity. This film is a love letter to space, to science, to humanity, to filmmaking, and to love itself. Right from the off, we're presented with Coop and Murph and the bond between them. Their relationship is what we hang our hat on and why we immediately identify with and root for them both. It's why we understand Coop's reason for leaving 
and it's also why we understand Merce's reasons for resenting him for it. We slowly learn about Dr. Brand's love for her colleague. She's the one that introduces us to the idea that love is a force that we can measure, and an instinct to follow when logic can't give us all the answers. An instinct that ended up being right as the planet they ultimately decided to abandon in favour of Dr. Mann's turned out to be the correct option all along. We see love expressed in a different way by Professor Brand, a love for humanity so deep that he was willing to sacrifice his humanity to ensure that the human race continued. No way to help us. After their visit to the first planet cost them 23 years, we get one of the most heartbreaking scenes I've ever seen, as Coop is forced to sit and watch helplessly as his children grow older in front of him, their lives flashing by in an instant, knowing he's missed all of it. His son finding love, the birth and death of a grandson mere seconds apart, the loss of his father. 2014 was a great year for film, but I don't care what anyone says. McConaughey deserved an Oscar for this scene alone. You once told me that when you came back we might be the same age, and today I'm the age you were when you left. <laughs> this might be a real good time for you to come back. When Coop ends up sacrificing himself by falling into the black hole, we get the reveal that he was drawn here by future humans. Humans that had outgrown three-dimensional space and could now bring about the events that saved them all those millennia ago. They are us. That's why they care so much about saving us. Fifth-dimensional humans, powerful and evolved enough to access all of time and space and manipulate gravity to do so but unable to communicate because they couldn't access specific points in time. They needed Coop because in order for Murph to save humanity, they needed the one missing piece of the equation. They were able to represent their 5D reality in a 3D space so that Coop could understand it, but with all dimensions essentially moving back too, the third dimension becomes the first dimension, meaning Coop has all of time to explore. An infinite amount of moments, but all centred around one space. The bookshelf. So how does he find one specific moment in a sea of infinite time? Well, that's where we come back to Brand's theory about love. That it is a force that guides us. That it's more than just a feeling. The catalyst and the bridge for everything, the key to saving humanity, a father's love. A measurable, quantifiable thing that can cross space and time and guide him to her to complete the process. Gravity and love, the two things that can transcend space and time. Love can travel faster than the speed of light, it can escape black holes, it can travel through time, and it can connect us no matter where we are. There's a phenomenon in physics called quantum entanglement, where particles are linked to each other, even if they're light years apart. I like to think that's what love is. No matter where we are in the universe, love is the invisible force that binds us. This film champions two things throughout its 169 minute runtime. Science, and love. Science because logic and reason and knowledge will save humanity from itself and from other horrors that await us in the universe. And love because when cold-hearted logic and reason fails us, love will be there to spur us on. Scientific curiosity piqued Coop's interest in flight and a job at NASA, but it was love that took him out to the stars to make a better life for his daughter, even if he would never see her again. Science sparked Merce's fascination with space, but it was love that made her dedicate her life to it and what brought her back to the bookcase to save humanity. We as the audience cared less about what happened to humanity than we did about whether Coop would see Murph again. Their love is the linchpin, the heart of this film. Science and love cannot work independently. Only when you have both will you truly make a difference. Science will save humanity. Love will be why.